I will call this meeting to order at, eight, or at 6.30. And in accordance with Chapter 20 of the Act of, Acts of 2021, signed by Governor Baker on June 16th, 2021, suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law uh, 30A, this meeting of the North Reading School Committee is being conducted with some remote participation. While in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted and a quorum of the school committee will be in person, this meeting is concurrently being presented through a Google Meet and or live broadcast live on NORCAM to allow the public and any school committee members who cannot attend to participate. And we have attending school committee members, uh, Mrs. Imbriano, Mr. Papavasileo, and Mrs. Boutwell, and Mr. Buckley is participating remotely. And the first item on the agenda is uh, public input. Uh, if anyone has, uh, who's on the Google Meet or in person has anything, any comments that are not related to a current agenda item, you can uh, speak up or uh, let us know you'd like to speak. Hearing none, we'll go on to the student report. And I think Sophia Galupa is here. Sophia? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start off tonight with the academic report. Um, the PSATs were held at school on Saturday for sophomores and juniors. And additionally, the guidance department is again coordinating meetings during Powerball with local admissions offices and various colleges and universities. Um, this is a resource for seniors as they go through their college process. And in mid-November, uh, the MCAS will be helping seniors looking for scholarship opportunities, as well as those working for their skill of bioliteracy. In the fine arts, um, the Newsies rehearsal um, are underway, and the performance will be held in late November. Masters is holding the Haunted Playground this weekend, which is always very successful. The marching band hosted the MICCA competition for the first time since 1991 for surrounding towns. Here, many NRHS students, coaches, teachers, and parents all came to support them. And the marching band traveled to Wakefield High School this past weekend to compete um, against other towns, and their percussion scored very well. And everyone did very well. Um, in athletics, all teams are doing well in their respective leagues and seasons. Um, boys cross country is one and three. Girls cross country is 0 and four. Field hockey is five, six and one. Golf is 10 and three. Boys soccer is six, three and one. Girls soccer is six, one and five. Volleyball is five and, is four and eight, excuse me. And football is having a great season, a record of five and one. Many teams are honoring different causes during their seasons, um, like volleyball, field hockey, and boys soccer. They're all raising awareness for breast cancer. Volleyball and boys soccer both held um, fundraiser games, while field hockey has been wearing pink jerseys. Also, girls soccer is planning to raise awareness for type 1 diabetes in November by wearing blue. All sports continue to prepare and train in hopes for the upcoming state tournament. Boys soccer has qualified already, but uh, girls soccer and field hockey are very close. Um, clubs are continuing to um, have their early meetings and they're working on scheduling them in accordance to this new normal. With the later start time, many clubs have found difficulty in um, scheduling their meetings at their typical after school time with um, sports being earlier now. So many have taken advantage of new resources like Google Meet to be able to orchestrate these meetings at unusual times, like in the evenings or even mornings. And then lastly, I wanted to, for my student work, I wanted to talk about my bioethics class. Um, currently in our intro unit, a subtopic we are looking at is identifying and understanding bias. Through this education, we've delved into the various types of bias and how they're inevitably integrated into all of us. Um, in class, each student was assigned a different type of bias to learn about and research. I researched confirmation bias, um, and then we compiled all of our findings into one shared Google Slides 
to be able to exchange information and take notes about each type of bias. Um, after gaining this understanding of each type, we investigated various controversial topics in both hypothetical and um, real case studies like vaccine mandates, cosmetic limb removal, medical autonomy, and assisted suicide. Um, here we were able to identify how bias penetrates through all aspects of life. And we took these ideas and used them to conduct a debate and like class discussion in our class. Um, this just gave us a good understanding of how to effectively argue and do it in a more um, productive manner than is typically seen in our society. Thank you very much, Sophia. Does uh, anybody in the committee have any questions? Scott, do you have anything? Nope, excellent job, Sophia, as always. And start, sorry to hear the football lot five and one, because I know it's five and oh, so I was just looking up and saw that they lost this weekend, which is sad. <laughs> They're having a great season for sure. All right, thanks, Sophia. Great job, Thank Sophia. You. Thank great you. Great job. Uh, moving on, um, we're going to skip over uh, the Dr. Daly's reopening or ongoing uh, update uh, since we have some guests here to talk about the Model UN trip approval. Um, I believe if everyone is here as advertised, uh, we have uh, in person Aidan Patel is here and I think online Kristen Galvin and uh, Sultan Saparlis. Uh, so if you guys have a presentation, and Mr. Pinsopoulos, we take it away. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you all for having us here today. Uh, I hope you can all hear me all right from uh, at home right now. Um, I, I do have a few students with me, too, and I, I think that in the past when we've come to uh, seek approval for this trip, I always tried to give a quick rundown of what the, um, the trip would look like and offer an opportunity for the students to kind of speak on their own behalf reasons as to why they wanted to be to take part in the trip and uh, also to answer any questions you may have but I'm obviously here as well to help with any of the logistical questions um, my name is Satiris Pinsopoulos I've um, been a chaperone and run this trip for the past I think it's been 10 years now um, I'm an advisor of the model United Nations Club at the high school and this has always been our big trip of the year um, it's multiple nights at the um, at the event in Boston. We work out of the uh, hotels off of the Prudential, so it's out of the Sheridan Hotel as well as the Copley Marriott. Um, the The trip runs from Thursday, January 28th through Sunday, January 30th, and it's run by Harvard, Harvard undergrads. Um, it's a great opportunity for students to you know, learn about um, global events and how the United Nations functions and you know how diplomacy works and the protocol of uh, committee meetings and hearings. And uh, the club at the school, we try to meet as often as possible. Um, right now we're on a bi-weekly meeting um, in the evenings. And not just to prepare for the events or the, the trip, but to have students at North Reading High School to become more savvy of these international affairs and you know, events going on all over the world. Um, HMON, as we call it, Harvard Model United Nations, is a unique opportunity to meet with students from hundreds of countries all over the world uh, in past years. Um, there's been representation from nearly half of the world's nations and thousands of students um, involved in the committees. Um, last year it was a virtual meeting. Uh, this year Harvard is expecting to um, have it held in person, you know, with all the masks. Uh, they have the indoor mask mandates throughout the city of Boston. Um, and I could obviously answer any questions that may um, be logistically about the day to day, but it's a great event for students to work with students from all over the world and learn from the experience. And it, they are full days. We leave here Thursday midday. Uh, we spend um, most of the day in committee sessions. The days end around 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock even at night. Um, committee sessions run anywhere from two to three hours. There's also social events uh, taking place. There's opportunities for students to learn about different travel opportunities all over the world at both the high school and collegiate level. Um, I mean, I could say a lot about the, the event. Uh, I don't have a presentation, so to speak, nothing to really pass around. Um, their website is HMON, HMON.org, Harvard Model United Nations, where you can find a lot about um, what they're offering for students. Uh, my hope is that Sultana, 
Aiden and Kristen can speak to uh, their desires and uh, also their experiences because they've taken part in the conference in the past. So I don't know who wants to start. So I can speak a little bit on the topic just to build off of what is saying. I was fortunate enough to go in person my sophomore year and it was an incredible experience to say the least. I was able to meet so many different people, um, not only from the United States, but from other countries. Um, it was really an incredible experience. I was in this huge room with thousands of other students, and it was incredible to think that we were debating about global topics, you know, as high schoolers. And I just hope that it will be something we'll be able to continue. And hopefully this year we'll be able to take part once again in the conference. Um, I just, I can't really say enough about it. I think it's a really good experience. Last year it was online and very, very fortunate that they did do the conference. But of course it didn't compare to the in-person experience. And I'm really hoping that this year we'll have that opportunity and I'll gladly uh, give it over to Aiden to say anything else. Yes, so uh, I can speak to my experiences a little bit about the conference. Uh, I'm a sophomore at North Reading High School, so last year was my first experience with Model UN um, and it was online of course. Uh, although it wasn't ideal, it was definitely an incredible experience for me to be able to meet so many other international students and learn their views on diplomacy around the world. Um, being able to participate on a stage like that with so many other students, and uh, it was just really incredible for me. Um, I've heard so many great things about this conference from not only my other classmates, but teachers that run the uh, club and other students that I met along this journey. And so I'm really hopeful that we are able to you know, take this opportunity and really learn something new from it. Uh, so I can pass it along to Kristen if she's here. Unfortunately, Kristen was not able to make it to the meeting today, so it's the two of us. Okay, thank you both. Uh, um, I was curious uh, if there were any limitations on, on the, the sort of uh, the participation from other countries, uh, given what's happening, is it going to be a smaller participation this year? Yes, I, I believe, uh, like a lot of things this past uh, year and a half here, it's, uh, the, um, the guidelines have been changing in terms of the expectations. Last sure. I read, uh, we're still awaiting, like, um, for instance, what country will be representing and the background guides. A lot of the materials uh, don't come out the final materials till November or December as the conference is in late January. Um, but last time I read, they were talking about um, mask mandates indoors, which are obviously still the case, and also um, uh, requiring um, vaccinations. So I don't know on their end what documentation they're gonna have on that, but that will obviously limit, um, I would think, some of the international um, student involvement uh, but I, I believe their their goal is to go fully in person. They're not trying to do um, anything remote or hybrid. But if it's entirely up to Harvard, you know, if they decide that they want to incorporate international students um, in a virtual setup, it may be that they do some sort of hybrid where uh, students from the U.S. are in person and maybe internationals are, are not. Uh, but that, that could change in the next few months. But... Uh, everything I've seen has been heading in the right direction for the past six months, which has been good in terms of um, the com the conference running fully. That's great. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Scott has his hand raised. Scott? I, I, I just want to add that, you know, it just thank you guys for coming and presenting. I think that there's a lot of events that happen in North Reading. You know, and I think we talk a lot about sports and the maskers, but, you know, personally, I think this, this particular conference, the Model UN, I, I think it's one of the best groups we have in North Reading. I think it's one of the best events that we do. So I, I highly encourage you and, and support your participation. I appreciate, um, you know, the leadership in getting this done. And 
you know, I've never heard anything but positives from this experience, and I just really am glad of all. I know I know there's a lot of time that goes into these these events, but I really appreciate doing it because I think it's you know one of the best things that happens in North Reading. So thank you guys. Yeah, and I and I you know kudos to Harvard for going full bore and trying to do as much as they can in these circumstances too. So I hope they I hope they can pull off a a really close to normal event. Uh, um, in January. All right, I think we uh, need a vote to approve, so I'll entertain a motion. I would like to make a motion to approve the model UN trip to um, Boston in January. Okay. Second. Motion by Janine, second by Diana. We'll take a roll call vote since Scott is remote. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Scott? Aye. And I am, I am an aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your participation. Thank you. And good luck in January. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Have to keep us updated what country they get. Yeah, but that'll be interesting to, to, uh, to hear about. I can't remember what it was last yeah, I'd love Croatia. to have them back and give you a brief. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, a debrief would be great. Yep. It is. It is a great event. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr. Vitsopoulos. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all. No problem. Thank much. you again for the invitation. Year before, I'm sure it was, was canceled Croatia. last year. Okay. Yeah. You know. I thought they. I mean, maybe, maybe. but. All right, Dr. Daly. Great. So just. Yep. Just a few things to share. I think we are still. Um, you know our. our our cases and our case count um, are certainly down. I, I've said to Mr. McGowan, I, I, I struggled a little bit still calling this reopening because we've been open for school now for, for over a month, but um, I wanted to keep it on there as a standing agenda, my, uh, uh, agenda item. So I may change it to a, a new business item next time and then move it back. Um, but this is really just an, an update for COVID uh, related items. I think it makes a lot of sense. There, there's some things that are still not typical this year. And so we just wanted to provide a few updates in that respect. Um, with regard to the extension of the, the mask mandate through November 1st, there are no uh, real changes at this time. We have the ability as of October 15th to present for any schools that we feel would be at 80%. Um, we are not at that threshold with any of our schools. Again, the middle high school is combined into one campus, which sort of changes that dynamic. And I think that by the time we come to November 1st, I think we'll have probably some different metrics and some different information on the table. Um, I'm optimistic from what I'm hearing that we will have vaccination available to the youngest group of students in the coming weeks as well. We have a vaccination clinic set for November 4th. So if, if the vaccination is approved for the younger children by that time, they would be able to sign up for that clinic. Typically that's been just, um, a good number of students turning 12 who participate in those as they their birthdays um, and then some others that may want to get involved um, so there's that that option exists for more to, to join if, if that becomes available um, and I think as we see those opportunities taking hold and the cases going down across the state and in North Reading I think there might be some other um, as the Commissioner has put it some off off um, off ramps for the mask mandate. So we'll have more information on that soon. And um, I think we've discussed that, you know, we, we can always discuss here. We don't have to follow everything that comes out um, either, either way from the state. So one thing that was clarified for me is, you know, it was not a, I did not have to report on October 15th. October 15th was reframed as the, the earliest we could make that request if we had the data. Okay. And so when we surveyed, we, we're not there yet, we're collecting. Um, I have collected staff data and we're in the process of collecting student data. Um, my thought is to not share that yet because I think, because the urgency wasn't quite there, I think the numbers um, are a little bit lower than I expected because I think there's just people that haven't turned in you know, by the deadline. So I, I'm extending the deadline a little bit. I can share later. But, um, but we do have um, a good number of staff who participated in stuff that And I forgot, I should probably have this over here. And um, 
we're continuing with our testing protocols. Uh, we have a few changes coming with the the provider and the you know, but it really sh really shouldn't hit uh, and make any changes to what we're doing operationally. Our nurses that are assisting with that are doing a fantastic job. We also contracted um, two employees to to work for the the vendor to come out and assist us. They, as everywhere else in the world is experiencing a staffing shortage, they, they suggested that we recruit. We had 38 people um, respond very, very quickly to my request for help. So I'm so appreciative of, of our community, parents and, and friends of the schools that responded right away. Um, we chose two individuals with medical or clinical backgrounds um, who are also involved in our schools as, as parents. And they've been a, a huge asset to our district and so they were able to start very quickly and they were, they were there last week and they're there again today. Um, we're testing, pool testing on Mondays and Wednesdays and we, as I mentioned, we opened it up again. We have over 600 students participating and over 100 staff. So um, it's quite an operation, but it's, it's going, um, going very well and it's helped us to identify a few cases, but for the most part, we, are, um, we have had no positive pools. Um, other than on the first couple of days of this. So our case counts are down. We are, we've had, in the last um, week or so, we've had about four uh, cases in the district. Again, no transmission in the schools. These are individuals that tested positive, uh, a mixture of staff and students, but no transmission in the schools. So quite, quite down um, from where we were um, only recently, so. Um, we are continuing to, um, you know, experience some some of the different protocols and having those protocols in place um, for contact tracing in in our schools. The test and stay is still very effective. So when students are positive in school, we're able to do test and stay. And we've we continue to have a good number of students that are able to continue to come to school every day because that is in process. And so. We've, we've got sort of a rolling admission for people as they want to participate in that. Pool testing is the only one that we've said, you know, we're gonna do it in chunks just so it's manageable. So I've, you know, right now, if someone is put in for pool testing, we'll have another window to, to allow others in in the future. But right now we try to get everybody in so that we can get our list and our rosters and our labels all made up. Um, but any questions about where we are with this at the moment? From the committee. No. no. Scott? No? None for me, thank you. I think we're good. I, got, I, I, I was wondering about uh, if we are still okay on bus drivers and, and that situation. I saw you guys put out, I uh, saw you put out um, information about the test uh, a few weeks ago. Yes. So I think, um, you know, we're doing, we're doing okay with that in this district. I think we've been, we've been fortunate. Um, some of the vehicles that we've been able to purchase over the last few years and bringing some of that in-house, I think has put us in a better situation. When I talk to some other districts who are really struggling with that, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Connolly's done a great job working with the bus drivers and the companies to keep them. I think, you know, some of the good, the goodwill that we earned last year by, by supporting the bus systems has helped. Um, but overall there are concerns with, with, you know, there, there are shortages in staffing, there's shortages in food and supplies. I think that North Reading has not been affected the way we've heard some other districts have been affected, um, but there are some overall, you know, concerns with all of those shortages and, and how they play out um, in the schools. Um, the the reason why we really push that the the area where we're probably feeling it the most is in our special education transportation, um, where we're using other vendors than a, the same vendor that we use for our day to day bus driving, and I think we've had some some issues um, with staffing there from time to time. And so that's really where that push came from. Um, it came out of special education. And you know, I, they, they have called in the National Guard to support a lot of cities and a lot of these other companies um, to help with some of, this, some of this driving. So that has helped. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that, Michael. I, no, I think you captured the, the bulk of it. And um, yeah, it's really this, it is the specialized transportation piece, um, which we have a contract as a reminder through, uh, through the SEAM collaborative um, regionalized transportation contract with, um, which is actually with NRP. And um, 
Ms. Conant and myself do participate in regular updates. They, they, I would give them credit. They've been proactive in trying to communicate out to school leaders um, the, the, their challenges and where, the, where things stand. So they are hoping to get a, a, a big influx of drivers through the certification process in the coming weeks, but they, they still think there's going to be some shortages for like about another eight weeks at this point is what is the latest report we got um, from them. So as Dr. Daly, um, you know, stated, I think, you know, we've been fortunate that we've been able to kind of manage these challenges um, and haven't been impacted at least to date as some of the, the other districts, larger districts, and um, and we're just continuing to, to kind of work through work through those challenges. But we've been, by, you know, shifting things more in-house, we're now, our specialized program used to be entirely in-town, and now we have our own drivers with our own specialized vans doing out-of-district transportation to, to, make, to make do. Um, and that, so far, is, is working without any major impact to student schedules and those types of things. So but we're, we're working through it right now. Great. I would say we're not so much fortunate as uh, it's being well managed. So, Thank you. Anything else on your update, Dr. Daly? I don't believe at this time. And any more comments from the committee, from, the, from our audience? No? All right. Then we will move on to start looking ahead. Large capital improvements plan presentation. Mr. Connolly? Yes, thank you. Um, so I do have a, a PowerPoint presentation that I'll kind of walk through. I'll try to move as quickly as I can. Um, there was a copy of the presentation in your packet this evening. Um, but certainly the time has come as we approach the middle of October to start looking at large capital. And, um, typically, this is you know our budget process. We sort of focus on our large capital program first, and then we kind of move to in, into the operating budget and small capital as we get into the later months. Um, but this is the agenda I'd like to follow. I, I'd like to first take a step back and, and just update the committee on how we've, what we've, the update on the projects that were approved last June in fiscal 21 and fiscal 22. So we did have projects that were approved in the previous fall town meeting in, in, in October 2020. Um, as well as in the June 2021 town meeting. So I want to just update on where those projects stand. Um, then I want to focus tonight's presentation on the large capital request specifically for fiscal 23. Um, and then look, also look to the future over the next, really the next three to five years, as there was um, a five-year capital plan update also included in your packet. Um, once I do that, I'd like to review the CIPC timeline and process. Um, Mr. Embriano and I had our first meeting about a, a last week, so we've kind of got more updates on, on that process and that timeline. And then I want to leave plenty, plenty of time for discussion and questions. We're not going to ask the committee to take a formal vote this evening in support or endorsement of the plan. We're just kind of hoping to provide the information tonight, open up the discussion. And then at the next meeting, we'll ask for some formal vote of the priority order of the projects and what changes there may be, um, because they're not due to the capital improvement plan to about mid-November. So we have, we have a little bit of time. So looking back through fiscal 21, fiscal 22, large capital projects update. If you go back to the previous June, um, we did have one, uh, one item approved and that was the F-350 pickup truck replacement, and I'm happy to report we received this truck in. This is a, a photo of it, and we've certainly are getting good, good use out of this vehicle. Um, going back to the fall um, for, for fiscal 21, we received approval of the Hood School Handicapped Accessible Lift. That was completed last spring. Um, and it's been inspected and certified, and here's some photos of that assess new accessible lift at the Hood School. We also received an allotment of funding to begin middle school HVAC upgrades. So that uh, project was recently completed and um, commissioned um, a couple weeks ago. And that project really involved some replacement of some equipment and, and, and faulty um, you know, unit ventilators, e equipment in some particular wings of the building, in particular the C-wing. And we also used some funding to begin 
the automation pro process of the energy management system. There was some funding available to do that. So we, we, we started that process as, as well. And, um, it's, been, it's been great to get that, that building um, you know, up to speed on a similar system that the bachelor school and the middle school and the high school enjoy. Um, we also received funding for the new multifunction activity school bus. I'm happy to report that vehicles were received in July and it's really gotten a, a tremendous amount of use already. We now have two of these vehicles and they're, they're 14 passenger vehicles plus the driver. And it really, like I said, when we requested it, it's really a game changer for athletics and extracurricular. We can now really transfer a lot of the transportation um, and do a lot more in-house athletically because access to these two vehicles, we can now take a varsity team and a JV soccer team to an event. Um, and similarly to what we just discussed with the shortages of the drivers, um, certainly, fortunately, it hasn't impacted us on the regular school bus runs, but it's certainly been an impact on the athletic charter runs. And having access to these two vehicles has really helped, helped us manage that much better this fall. Um, so that's been great. It's been great to have these. Um, the toolcat was received, and here's some photos of the toolcat. So we're really excited to have this utility vehicle, four-season utility uh, vehicle, at our disposal. We can, you know, use this for a variety of purposes. Um, we continue to wait for one attachment, and it's it's a key attachment. It's the snowblower. Um, hoping that comes in in the next couple of weeks is the update we're getting right now. But that one was the one item that was back ordered. We're hoping we don't need it for. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, better not. But if that if that's received, certainly by, by in November, you know, we'll be okay. Um, but it's just a great it's a great vehicle. The little school soffits and fascia project was completed this summer, and I was really pleased with the outcome of that project. We um, did a bid and contracted with the new general contractor that we had not used in the past, and they did an exceptional job. They were on budget, on time on time, on schedule, and here's some photos of their work, and they did, they worked very neatly, and they just did an exceptional job this summer. The Little School paving project in the parking lot in the main staff area, as well as expanding the old playground gravel area to pick up some additional parking spots um, was completed, and I think the, the contractor did an exceptional job and the, the project was striped this summer prior to the opening of school. We picked up, you know, I think at least 14 to 15 parking spots there as we expected to, and it just, it came out really, really nice. So that's been, that's been great to get that project completed. Um, the computer devices. So this is one project, I'll talk a little bit about it later in the presentation. If you may recall, we received $120,000 allotment to purchase two grades. Uh, we actually, because we were able to leverage some COVID funding and grants and even some year-end funding at the end of fiscal year 2021, uh, we did not really need to expend this funding over the summer once it was approved in the June town meeting. Um, and I, we actually talked a little bit about it with the CIPC. So you'll see this, that decision will have an impact on our future requests as we look to the future. But it's, I think it's a positive thing. We, we, we got the, the books that we needed. Um, through some other alternative funding sources that we didn't know at the time last, last winter and spring when we were advocating for this funding. But that became available later and we were able to get the devices and refresh the, the cycle that we needed, needed to. So we'll be able to, to certainly use these funds and we plan on doing so later, later in the year. The instructional technology equipment. So we received $45,000 to re essentially replace the interactive display boards, smart boards in the elementary classrooms that were well past their useful life. So this was one funding source. We've been using some grant money and some, some other um, you know, operating funding money and some PTO donation money to do a lot of this over the last two or three years at the elementary schools. But we, with this allotment, we were able to replace 10 boards um, at all three elementary schools, I think it was four, three, and three. And they, this is a picture of one at the Bachelor Elementary School, they, and they came out exceptional. This was completed in September, a couple weeks after the start of school. And I, we were impacted by COVID delivery delays and shipping delays um, to not get this done in August like we had hoped, but they did get completed by the end of September. And, um, and all reports are is that the classroom teachers and principals are very pleased with the outcome. 
quick reminder, we, we had two uh, projects funded through SSBC. We got some additional funding to make some upgrades to the softball field, so we were able to do that over the last couple of years with a scoreboard, with some dugout enclosures, with some, um, you know, a PA, supportable PA system is also available. We did some, some windscreens um, behind the dugouts, and it, it really gave a nice finishing look to this athletic field, and it came out, it came out exceptional. Um, we also got some SSB funding, um, leftover funding uh, that was approved by the SSBC recently to install some athletic lighting. So the top picture was the lights that we were able to install um, that we actually had in stock. And we worked with an electrician in town um, to get those installed this, this past spring. And then we are due to receive through the SSBC funding allotment um, the next phase of that project, which would install two additional poles on the other side of that multi-purpose grass practice field behind the stadium field <coughs> adjacent to the softball field um, to fully lit light that athletic field. So it's going to be provide much more flexibility, much, much more versatility of a soccer field, a practice lacrosse field, and not only for the school but for youth programs. Uh, Pop Lana, lacrosse, the spring, it will allow us to do the town and the school to benefit significantly. So those polls are due to arrive uh, November 8th, believe it or not, and then we have already contracted with an installer to begin the installation work. If all goes according to plan, I think, you know, it could potentially be done by, by Thanksgiving. So that's, that's the goal right now. Okay, so I'm going to move on to um, the future and some updates to the capital plan as we look towards fiscal 23 through fiscal 27. We put together a five-year plan, but we certainly focus on the, the early three years because that's the, the window that CIPC uh, focuses on. So we typically put, the, when we put together a capital plan, as a reminder, we're looking at projects that cost um, $25,000 or more and have a useful life of five years or more. That's the criteria. Anything that's less than $25,000 on a kind of pure unit cost or, or a project in its total, or the less than useful life of five years, that would be qualified as small capital. And we typically break ours down into kind of like vehicles, equipment um, would qualify uh, under the first category, technology, instructional technology, administrative technology, um, and then facilities. So those are the three criteria, categories we're, we're looking at. Here's a quick snapshot of the three-year request. Um, so there's a few requests in 23 that I'll talk about. Um, and then you can see some, there are going to be in the later years, once we get you know, some high ticket items on the facility end, when you start looking at um, the Hood School roof project, that, that roof's going to certainly need some work and I think we're in need of a, a restoration type project. Um, and then there's just a collection of other, other needs as we look at the facility end that are higher ticket items as we, as we get through fiscal 24 through fiscal 27. So I'm going to focus on technology first. So the first request for fiscal 23 and then again in, in 24 is for an allotment of $67,500 and this will just continue that replacement plan of um, interactive and in, device, you know, in projection setups within the elementary classrooms, again, across all three elementary schools. Um, certainly, as we've been spoken about in the past, these, these smart boards are, you know, more than 12 or 13 years. Many of them are repurposed from the middle school and the high school. They're starting to break down, and the solution that we've developed is sort of a um, kind of a one-stop solution that provides one interactive device that will serve all three of the previous functions with the classroom desktop and the overhead uh, projector and in the interactive board um, in the, at the front of the room. So it's we believe that you know, over time this, that this solution will require less ongoing maintenance and supply costs and it could certainly help eliminate the need to replace projector bulbs and troubleshoot projector issues which do get costly as well as time consuming for our technology staff to be able to handle. Um, to date, through the allotment that we had in fiscal 22, the 45,000, we also got an allotment a couple of years ago, as well as through some general fund and some grants and some PTO donations, we've been able to replace 34 boards across three of these, um, all three schools. 
And there are about 55 boards remaining in need of replacement. Um, so we actually feel like if we stay on schedule and over the next two fiscal years, we get an allotment of this allotment uh, approved and as well as uh, some state grant that we have available and through a combination of just some operating budgets and some PTO donations that have been coming in, we feel like over the next two years, by the start of fiscal year 24, we could have all of the boards of the elementary schools replaced. And that would be, that would be our, our, our chief objective. So the $67,500 requests would essentially allow us to replace um, 15 smart boards, five at each school. And we, we would be asking for that in over the two next two fiscal years. And we also have some state earmark grant funds through Brad Jones um, that we received and through some um, instructional technology budgets that we've identified that, that we can hopefully have at the end of the fiscal year. We, we feel like we can stay on schedule and make this, make this happen, which would be great. So that, that is, that is the, the goal. Um, the computer replacement plan. So I mentioned earlier that we did not need to spend the $120,000 like we had planned. So originally back a year ago in the fall when we were presenting and advocating for this funding in December and January, um, we definitely felt like to keep the one-to-one -one student device environment uh, going in grades K through 12, which of course was accelerated due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we were able to use many of the, the COVID-19 funds, reopening funds, and technology grants that we were able to secure CARES Act funding to really r r ramp up our supply and get um, devices in the hands of all students through K through 12. Um, that's a program that we want to keep going. We seem to think that's essential, um, that we want to uh, make sure that there's a working appropriate device um, for grades kindergarten through grade 12. So we feel we can spend that $120,000 later this year purchase up to two grades and once we do that we, we don't think we would need to refresh a cycle of um, of student devices again until fiscal 25 through the CIPC that because of the the COVID money that we've had and the reopening funds and the CARES Act funds um, in combination with some operating dollars and the capital funds that we've received in the past our our age of the devices in end of life through grades kindergarten through 12 would carry us in through fiscal 24. Um, so then when we, now you flash forward uh, a couple of years in the beginning of fiscal 25, through a common, right now through a combination of, of CIPC funding of the $60,000 and what we were able to add through our operating budget, we would be able to re refresh at least two grades per year from that point forward. And that is, would be what was required to make sure that all, all of the grades in K through 12 have, um, are, not, are not breaking down, they're not at end of life, and that they're working uh, devices within age, between ages. You know, we're trying to get five to six years out of these devices, and we've had success at doing that. So that, that is the plan. We're obviously revisit that plan each year and assess the, the, um, the condition of the equipment and the condition of equipment coming to the end of its, its, its end of life. Um, but we feel right now with this program um, through the combination of right now of CIPC and operating dollars that this would be what would be needed uh, beginning in fiscal 25. Now that could change if we were able to advocate for some more operating dollars through two operating budget cycles, 23 and 24, that have yet to be, that we've yet to go through. We may not need this funding in fiscal 25 if, if, it, gets, if it gets decided that we can shift all this into our operating budget. And now those are conversations that we'll have with um, the school committee and obviously the board when we get to the operating budget. But right now, and based on what we've been doing previously, this is what would be required to make this happen. So we look at the, the whole picture in the future, um, just a little snapshot. So certainly fiscal 23 and 24 from a technology perspective, focusing on the display boards and the interactive boards in the elementary classrooms then fiscal 25 to 27 picking up that student device chromebook replacement program we need to, would be necessary we're also trying to be really proactive at assessing the age and the condition of our wi-fi infrastructure that's so important to not make, let that get to a point where it suddenly stops working on us and we're in mid-year and we need to do in-cast testing and everything is so reliant on having a robust 
Wi-Fi infrastructure. So we don't want to kind of get behind the eight ball and have it sneak up on us. So even though this building is in great shape, everything's working very well right now, um, it is eight years old. We are eight years into it. And you know, some, of the, some of these access points after 10 years kind of have a, that end of life program and need to be refreshed and, and, and updated. So we have had a couple of firms walking through the building, this building, um, this fall, kind of assessing the, the infrastructure taking a look at the equipment, mainly the access points, analyzing the, the end of life on these access points of when they might not be supported by the software and being, allowing us to reset them or do maintenance to them, as well as just the backbone, which uh, was uh, you know, all refreshed you know, eight years ago, but just the, the switches and, and everything that's kind of in that network closet. So we, we actually, some of the quotes that are coming in, we're still actually looking at them. So we, we got some quotes on Friday, some came in an hour ago, and uh, Patrick and I were looking at them. But we, we feel like around, the, around fiscal 25, two fiscal years from now, having an allotment of about $95,000 would allow us to refresh the equipment, maybe the access points, maybe a couple of these switches to get ahead of, of the situation and keep, make sure our infrastructure backbone and wireless access points remain top notch and you'll we'll get into a situation where something's not working. So that, that would be the plan again. It's two fiscal years out. We're going to continue to get, gather data, gather quotes, gather proposals, assess their need. But right now we, we feel like we can get, certainly get through the next two years, but that, that fiscal 25 year we'll need to have an allotment there to address it, to stay ahead of it. Um, and then fiscal 27, um, Similarly, we'd want to look at the elementary schools. So the elementary schools, if you recall, we had a very successful project through working through 95% of it was done through E-rate funding and federal grant funding where we were able to replace all three elementary schools Wi-Fi infrastructure. That occurred in fiscal year 2017. So around 27, now that, that infrastructure and that backbone and those access points and those switches would be 10 years old. So we want to have a similar assessment done. And because we've now replaced the wiring and the cabling and the switches and that backbone infrastructure, we don't think we're going to need the, the $440,000 commitment that was the elementary schools um, five years ago in 2017. But we do think we're going to need some equipment, some access point upgrades to make sure we get the latest and the greatest um, you know, you know, technology that's available as we all know, the improvements that are made with bandwidth and so forth of these access points, as well as an assessment of the switches. But I think we're, because we have good cabling and we're able to um, confirm with these firms that we don't need to upgrade any of those things at, at this point, um, we don't think we'll need that significant of, a, of an amount that we needed five and eight years ago with, with all four campuses but we'll definitely need to have that, that on our radar at that time. Um, so I'm going to move on to vehicles. So we actually think we can take a, a year off where we don't need to request a vehicle replacement next year. Um, but we do feel like fiscal 24, the 2011 special education spare van um, would need to be replaced. Um, it has about 103,000 miles on it now. It is used frequently, so we, we have four vans, as a reminder, special education vans. Three are in use every day by our three special education van drivers. One is used as a spare, but even, it, even though it is a spare, it is used uh, often when other vehicles need to be inspected or need to get put into the shop. And then when it's not being used in, its, in our regular program, it is used by extracurricular programs, performing arts, fine arts programs, field trips, and so forth in the afternoon. So it's very important that we have a reliable spare to turn to um, to keep the program running and functioning. So we do feel like we can get through another year, but then in fiscal 24, we look to replace this vehicle. And then at that point, the 2015, which is the next oldest vehicle in our fleet, would become the spare. And then we're once again in, in really good shape. We have a 2018, a 2019, a 2015, and a 2011. That makes up our special ed education fleet. So looking at future vehicle needs, the, the, the spare van, the 2011, is, is, would be first up in priority for replacement. 
We then have the 2014 Ford F450 utility truck, which we think it's getting the mileage is getting up there, the engine time is getting up there. We've had to the costly repairs um, to this vehicle is starting to creep in there. Uh, we started at the end of last year a little bit, so we we do feel like that needs to be put on the radar around fiscal 25 for replacement. That's a little bit more of a costly vehicle. Um, and then we do have this Kubota tractor trailer that's um, we want to just put on the radar. It's, it's okay condition right now, but it's it is you know 20 would be over 20 years old at that time. And then again, that's been the 2015 special education van potentially five years from now. Um, when that one's 12 years old, we want to look, we want to assess the condition of that vehicle and see if that needs to be replaced and so forth. So now I want to focus on the facilities. So I spoke earlier about the little school HVAC upgrades. So we were able to do a lot with the $65,000 know, that we received to address some of the HVAC issues that the little school was having, particularly in certain wings of the building. Um, because we, that project didn't end up being as costly as we thought in the C wing, we were able to use some additional funding to expand that project into other classrooms and wings of the building and, and, and start to actually automate the system. So what we did was when we replaced some of the equipment in some of those unit ventilators in those classrooms, we kind of shifted that and replaced some of the um, equipment to, to, to valves and move to, to an automation system um, and get everything online through our energy management system, which allows us to regulate and, and, and modulate that building much more closely, saves on energy costs. So we got you know, about, you know, half the building complete and we want to, another allotment is needed to continue continue that work that's kind of what we discovered um, when we got when we decided to work through and we actually had an, another engineer come through and assess the building and, and work with us and make recommendations and then we were able to take those recommendations and that assessment and to do a bid to, to, to really address some of the, 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 the key is, uh, issues and concerns in the building so um, what we've Discover though is another allotment of about $100,000 would allow us to continue to address some of the unit ventilators and the equipment that were discovered to be really in, in, in poor condition that would need um, to either be fully replaced or the brains of those unit ventilators would need, to, would need some work to, to be updated and upgraded. And then we want to expand the energy, energy management system to not be just in sort of the C wing and the A wing. We wanted to expand it in the B wing, the gym, the common areas, the library, to get the full, the full, um, the full school um, automated and balanced and, and, and functioning in the system. So that, that would be the plan. Um, we have estimates, because um, we actually, when we bid out the funding that we did have for, for the C wing and the A wing, we actually did an alternative, uh, we received alternative bids, even though we knew we didn't have the funding. And so we have a really good idea of what that project's gonna cost to do the whole building. Um, so that's about $70,000. And then with some of the funding we needed to address some of the, the faulty ventilators and the valves and the equipment uh, would make up the difference. We feel like we can get that building really, really um, fully automated and highly functioning with the significant improvements to the ventilation system. Um, and there's the balancing of the, of the building would be that much better, of the heating and cooling. The next project is the HVAC rooftop replacements at the elementary school. So this has been on the project, uh, on the, pro the plan for a while. We've kind of deferred it a couple of years as we continue to assess the condition of the rooftop units. But we, we, this summer and this fall, we really kind of had a couple of companies walk through um, and assess the condition. And we, last year, we, we did experience some equipment, particularly at the little and the batch. Some of these rooftop units needed significant up, updates and repairs to keep those functioning. Um, so those would certainly be a priority uh, for replacement. Uh, but this project of $100,000 would focus on replacing the two HVAC units that were installed back in 2006. It wouldn't fully replace those units. Um, we actually thought it's cheaper and more cost effective, particularly to kind of re repair um, and replace the whole brains of the interior of the system, the, the condenser unit and, and the, the ventilator kind of in, in the interior of the building is in good condition. 
We just want to replace sort of the, the brains of the, of the rooftop unit uh, on, the, on the rooftop. And to do that, it's, it's significantly you know, cheaper than a full replacement. Um, and then the four, the units at the little school, there's two, two units at the little school that are uh, over 20 years old. Been, we've had to put a lot of funding and costly repair, repairs into it in recent months. Those would be fully, fully replaced. And um, there's actually two units at the Hood School that we feel like we can get some additional years out of, and, and but we'll certainly focus on. Um, those can be addressed with small capital updates, we feel like, over the next, over the next couple of years. But this $100,000 would take care of the bachelor school and the little school and replace those units and just continue to improve just ventilation and heating and cooling at, at all these elementary schools. Uh, yes. Just a quick question. So, replacing the little school, like like it says here, would improve the efficiency. Um, presumably, that would lead to savings on energy costs. Is that factored into the fifteen thousand per year estimate from the last slide, or is this an additional savings that could come from? from so the it's. Project? I think it's, it is factored in. So we we feel like automating the building, and then as well with just putting in better equipment and just higher efficiency equipment on would combine to about a $15,000 savings on an annual on an annual basis could be more if we're fortunate but fuel keeps going up in price it'll, right it'll be more. but there's definitely a need in both areas it's, there's that interior of equipment the some of the unit vent classroom ventilators the, the, the management system and then the roof it, it all it all goes together but then the, the rooftop units you know, once they get over 15 years old, they start to break down. There's more costly repairs, and I think the time, even though we've been able to kind of defer these projects and, and get get more more years out of them, but particularly the two small units at the Little, um, which would be about $10,000 each, quite honestly, and then the the batch, which are the larger ones, um, combined are about 70,000, and then there's some obviously some costs for installation and so forth, but. For about $100,000, we could do both schools and really get, um, you know, some good, some good life, life and it really enhance the, the building's ventilation system. So those, that, those are really the focus of fiscal 23. Um, but if you look at our five-year outlook on facility needs, so high-level focus on um, HVAC systems and rooftop units and ventilation improvements and bal balancing the heating and cooling system. Um, also, energy management, energy efficiency, always a long-term goal. It's a goal of our budget. Um, goals, I think these certainly fit into those. We're going to be able to, to automate the, the, the schools, to regulate the schools, to install higher, con higher efficiency equipment, um, regulate the building's um, schedules and so forth to, to really hopefully, as you said, save on energy. I think $15,000, my hope is that's a conservative estimate, but I think we'll achieve that. Um, so that's the focus of fiscal 23. Fiscal 25 would be once we get the little school system done, we want to address the hood school. So we kind of did the little school, this were to be funded in two phases. And then you, you would see in the future year of fiscal 25 would be to try to do something very similar to the hood school and go through and do a similar assessment and automate that building as well. Once that would be completed, then we would have all four campuses on the same schedule and we'd be able to, to, to regulate um, all four campuses the same way, which would, which would, be, which would be great. Um, fiscal 24 would be the Hood School roof restoration. Now that, we would potentially go for an accelerated repair project with the MSBA. That's something we could do. So we would want to watch that schedule later this spring, early next fall, if we're going to try to meet the fiscal 24 schedule, that's when we would need to be applying for that. Um, but that's something we could do. Um, the athletic field lighting, phase three of that, we've had some conversations, but that, that would be um, providing light to the outfield of Cary Park, which I know soccer and pop water and there's other events happening there. Um, so we would try to do some, some, some fundraising and maybe a combination of some, some fundraising dollars with potentially CIPC. We could try to complete what we were considering phase three of the athletic field lighting project. Um, but certainly from our minds, it's, it's the HVAC, the ventilation, it's the roof, it's the, the safety and, and, um, would, and the efficiency of, of the HVAC systems 
would be a higher priority right now. Um, and then the hood school mods, we've been deferring that and getting additional years out of the hood school mods. We know that's not going to last forever. We've got to address that. So that would be fiscal 25. And then the, and then the little school modular, uh, we would need a replacement of that unit, which that's another costly unit. And then the hood school boilers at that time would be about 30 years old and we would want to we want to address the boilers and that again that could that qualifies from from an msba accelerated repair project as well so that's our five-year outlook for facilities that's in the program um if you just right now if you just if you looked at what our priority order would be for fiscal 23 um which is what the cipc mainly looks at from year to year i think we would look at the technology um we really want to stay on schedule and get and replace the aging um, smart boards at these schools and then it would be completing that little school we've, we've we've kind of gone halfway we really want to get the full full school completed and then the rooftop units so you know three three total requests so we're not not asking for a lot we got a lot this year which we're pleased off we got, we got over four hundred thousand dollars of jobs done this year and co combined with last year um you know we're well over five hundred thousand dollars in 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 projects so we want to you know focus on technology hvac ventilation you know all these things are very much front and front and foremost of of the situation of COVID 19 and the pandemic we want to you know continue to make sure we have the latest and greatest technology and and make sure the the hvac systems are top notch so the, we think these projects would allow us to do that um reminder through the process so right now we're looking for school committee approval and endorsement of the our plan and our our request that we'll submit to the CIPC October November then the CIPC will start to meet um, at the beginning of December I think we're going to meet December 2nd and actually the schools are scheduled to make the first presentation to the CIPC on December 2nd then um, we'll hear from a lot of departments January through March and then around March they'll rank um, all of the projects they'll define they'll just come up with what we can afford and then that gets presented to the select board in April and then town meeting in June. Okay, that being said, just open up to any questions in discussion. Wow. Um, any questions from the floor? No. Nope. Scott's got a hand up. Scott? Hi, everyone. Michael, thank you. This is if, if, if getting the budget book is my Christmas morning, this is Thanksgiving morning for me. So. Right. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've got lots of comments and questions, so I'll, I'll go quick. First and foremost, I just want to formally thank the CIPC because, as you mentioned at the end there, we got a lot of funding last year. I know that's the most we've gotten in, in a number of years, and so very much appreciate that. And, and Mr. Connolly, I thank you because getting the funds is not enough. We have to actually use them, and you know, I, I appreciate when you started off the presentation talking about how you've implemented all of them. and. If you notice, there's no delays. When we get funds from CIPC, you immediately use them, and so I really appreciate your your leadership in doing that. Great, thank you. For for the vehicles, it's great to see that the fleet seems to be in pretty good condition, and and it seems like it's the best it's been in, in a number of years, and so it's good that we don't need anything. I'm a little nervous that we're not actually asking for enough, um, to be very honest, and so a couple of my comments and questions are about that. Number one, our, our request is lower this year and we have some big things coming up. Why, for, so my first question is, why are we splitting up the technology request over the next two years rather than trying to at least ask for them going in, ask for both of them to begin rather than splitting it up 67,000 each year? Mm -hmm. um, it's, a good, it's a good question. I think our conversations um, as an administrative team is just, you know, we're trying to, you know, again, everything's about trying to find that balance and trying to be, you know, obviously respectful and appreciative of the projects that we have been able to get funded through the CIPC. Um, myself, who sits on that board, um, I know Ms. Beltwell has been on that board. I think we have kind of an understanding of what's in the pipeline with the town. I mean, we, we know there's, there's a lot to get done. I think there was over $4 million of projects requested this year, and I think like about 1.5 got done. So there was a lot of projects town why they got deferred so we're trying to kind of understand that trying to certainly work work through the, pro the process with and um, also looking at our school's needs is we did feel 
that this was appropriate to, uh, you know, not put the schools in a condition where something's not working. If we, we felt like this timeline, we could work within this timeline by not requesting all of that at once and asking for 140,000. We felt like with uh, some of the, the, the funding with, through the grants that we have and with this allotment and with what we think we might be able to do with operating dollars as we do our budget projections um, at this point in the year, we felt like we could, we could stick to this timeline and within, within a, a year and a half almost have all the boards replaced. So it's almost this school year and, and another school year and then at the beginning of that, that's you know, fiscal 24, you know, 23, 24 school year. Um, the boards would be replaced, and we felt like that was a timeline the principals felt they could work with, um, and nothing would be breaking down and not working if we stayed in that timeline. So it was real, it was our attempt to kind of, you know, show some appreciation to um, the town and the boards that have supported the schools in the past over the last two years and approving all of our, all of our requests and trying to, you know, balance out the needs from a technology standpoint. Um, as we look to the future. Um, okay. um, the, the, the next question I have is about the things that maybe something that maybe not be on there. I noticed with the bathrooms at the high school, middle school, and I'm out there all the time, but just walking through, a lot of the faucets don't work, the electronic ones anymore. A lot of you know the the, the hand washing stations are having issues. Should we be investing some money in redoing some of the the bathroom fixtures and? maybe even thinking about putting in more privacy units and more you know units that could be used by all students not necessarily gender specific i know that's an issue that came up when we were when you guys were looking at the uh you know the nrps 2025 so should we be putting something about bathrooms in the facilities plan in the next five years i don't think it's large cap yeah uh but i i think i think for us to look at that, um, I don't think it's a lot. I think I think there are some second floor bathroom issues, which are the ones you've probably seen um, that are on our radar. But those yeah, need to get fixed. I'll definitely, yeah, it hasn't been reported my way that it's been such a large scale issue that it warrants a, a large capital project and it needs to be sort of you know fixtures and uh, need to be kind of replaced on a large scale. I think I think there's some some maintenance and repair work and some some things that need to be done that would be funding that would be included in our operating budget and maybe some small cap, but I, it ha I don't think it, at the moment it meets a large scale, um, large capital project. Okay, and then with, with the modular units, you, we're eliminating the hood and we're replacing the little? Correct. Why are, we, why are we not going to replace the hood in addition? Because I know that it's used, it's a revenue source for the district. Um, and I, I know we bring I bring this up every year. I'm a broker. Yeah, no, it's a good. It's something we've wrestled with, and I think you know the Hood School. We do have those three classrooms that are being used by Seam Collaborative, and it is a, it is revenue. It's not a significant. I mean, it's not. It's about twenty thousand dollars of revenue, um, on an annual basis, which is helpful. It helps offset our our maintenance budget and so forth. Um, but certainly replacing those units would be well over half a million dollars to replace. So I think it's the principal and the school and looking at enrollment, we felt like we could, if we were not to replace, certainly we would forego that, that $20,000, but we could um, take back those classrooms and with projected enrollment and, and looking at doing something creative with maker spaces and the li library, we would be able to make, make do without it. And then there's obviously, then you don't have um, the maintenance and the repair and electricity and, and um, inspections and sprinklers and everything that goes along with operating, uh, you know, the replacement of four modular modular units. But actually, that would be probably a million dollar project. So it's trying to trying to balance a, a, a really high ticket um, capital item that the town to, that we have to advocate for for the town against other needs that are similar and around a similar time frame with the hood school roof and boilers and the little school around that same timeline as well, that we don't have the, the flexibility at the hood where we're renting classrooms. Um, we would certainly need to replace that, which is kind of a larger unit. It's kind of like one and a half units at the little school. Um, but the hood school would probably be twice as much as the little, quite honestly, when we look at it from the classroom square footage and um, it was just trying to balance the needs with the cost and 
the timeline of everything else. And the principal in, uh, was very comfortable um, with being able to take back um, those rooms and be able to make, obviously, his educational program with the projections in the classroom's work. Right? Is that? Yeah. Make, make sense to me. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Ryan, right, do you have anything? No, Scott actually covered my question. I was going to ask you about the modules as well, so thank you for clarifying. And I guess my only question is about, and it's similar to what Scott mentioned at first, it's kind of a strategy question. Do we, do we, do we put a sacrificial lamb on as the fourth priority? Uh, and you know, those of you who've been on the committee a lot, uh, on the CAPC committee a lot, maybe have a better sense of whether that is something that would be useful or not. But um, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you have three projects, are they gonna approve two? Or is it really a, a little more straightforward than that, I guess? It, yeah, I mean, it gets, it's a little bit different every year. Yeah. You know, I think, I think last year we were, I would say it was the first time we ever had all projects funded. Yeah. And we were, we were fortunate that we, we had six requests and we got six funded and we got, we had three from the previous fall that got deferred and then funded. So we've had success in, in over the last couple of years. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think our requests, you know, uh, make sense. I think they're, they should be identified as high priorities. Um, they're not nice to have. They're, 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 you know, they, they need to happen from a technology instructional, t you know, standpoint, which I think everyone understands the importance of doing that. And then I think, especially in these times, um, it's important to address certainly HVAC, um, you know, equipment and, and automating and developing an energy efficiency system which has been a goal both from schools and towns from that approach. So I, I think, you know, I, we've always kind of taken the approach that we, you know, we want to just kind of be upfront and, and say, this is, this is the needs and we're trying to work with you and not, not request those, those extras right now. And yep. we know what the town's up against. We've seen the, the list. We know you're, you have needs as well that are, that are going to be high ticket items to address some of your, your buildings and town hall and certain areas. And this is, this is what we need and we're, we're trying to, you know, spread out those um, high ticket items that are coming as best we can, um, you know, not to put the town in a situation where it's, you know, unfairly has to come up with two, you know, very costly projects. And, I, and I think that makes sense. And, and I would, and I would just say that also the fact that we, ha you have such a clear plan for the five years um, makes it a lot easier to do that, that you, you know, there's no, there's no hidden surprises there in terms of what you expect to be asking for yep. from year to year. So, Scott, you had something else? Yeah, on this comment, just or this topic, just one more pushback on this is the town also has a lot of COVID funds. You talked about how we've been able to utilize some of the funds to pay for, you know, the, the devices going forward to put us in a better position in the future. The town also has a lot of COVID funds and I, and and they are willing to use them for whatever is needed, and I think that would include school projects. So, while I appreciate not wanting to ask for more than we necessarily need, I also want to make sure that if there are projects that they're looking to do that could be funded through some of the one-time funds that they've received for COVID, I just don't want to miss out on that. So, if they're looking for other projects that maybe educational, you know, usage could go mm -hmm. towards. I don't know. Maybe those are different funds in the CIPC funds, but I just know that there's, all, there's millions of dollars that have been given to North Reading to be used, and I'm just wondering if some of that could go through some of the CIPC projects. Dr. Daly? Just one, one thing that, that we talked about a little bit internally is the, you know, building upon what we discussed earlier about the, the shortage for, for drivers is, you know, upping that or even possibly um, adding to our special education fleet and bringing some of that in-house. Because mm -hmm. I know some of that COVID funding can be used for transportation because unfortunately the, you know, the, the driver shortages and the like might take a few years if, you know, if it's ever gonna course correct. Um, and we've had those successes with the vehicles that we've owned and operated internally. So that is something that we've yeah. considered. Um, so we can continue to think yeah. about that. Yeah, and I think, sir, I mean, I would think the HVAC is certainly something, I guess I believe some of those funding was related around infrastructure and, yes. you know, 
updates to ventilation and I think would potentially qualify as well. So we haven't gotten into it yet with the CIPC, but I'm sort of a fully in anticipating that there's going to be those conversations where, again, there's going to be $4 million of, of requests school and town wide or, you know, three, three plus million dollars. The CIPC we know can only do, uh, you know, 1.5 or 1.8 million. There's going to be another, you know, $2 million delta again. So I'm, ho I'm, I'm anticipating that's going to be part of those conversations as well through probably through CIPC and then again with finance planning time where you know, some of these projects that were CIPC requests would qualify for this one-time funding through um, you know, COVID-19 funding and so forth and you know, how do we get all of it done? You know, what, what can be shifted from CIPC to this funding? And I think a lot of the items we have here I think could qualify for that. Um, and that just helps but, but, more but, stuff get but, done. But not but something like the spare van asking for it next year rather than this year, you know, if it's a special education vehicle, maybe that should be moved up to this year to put it on the priorities this year so that it is part of the discussion. And I just feel like with the COVID funds right now, going in and asking for 267000 it may be short-sighted in the long run, even if we prioritize the items that have been put on here like the spare van would be something that would be a perfect example if that's been the internal discussion to say, oh, this is another thing that we need. Maybe it doesn't get funded through CIPC. Maybe it's the COVID funds later on. Mm -hmm. But anything that might be able to be used, have the COVID funds used for it, I think we should think about moving up. And if that's more instructional materials this year versus splitting it over two years or a spare van or, or well, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't explain it as a spare van. I would explain it as, a special education van and then because that'll that'll become I imagine one of the most used ones and the older one will become the spare van yeah and then you know if these challenges continue and you know does do we need do we change the program and does do we have four or five become the regular cycle and um, and you need six and then that six is a van is a spare so yeah I, I don't know I, I just don't have much information yeah. about what that funding has been and in the timeline and how it's working and and how it fits into how the it whole fits CIPC in. yeah, discussion as well. Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean I don't know, I'd love to meet me at the next finance planning team meeting. Yeah, yeah that might right. that might be yeah. a finance planning discussion as I think well that's to right. see how the how those things those conversations overlap. Yeah. You know, we could we could come up with a I mean because this this really is continuing our cycle moving forward sort of in some ways absent of COVID and maybe there's a way to have a, a separate conversation about COVID, the similar to the way we have NRPS related budget requests and, and typical budget requests, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's one that's sort of the COVID-19 list. And if things are eligible, you know, because, um, you know, this is sort of carrying forward our replacement cycle. But if we're trying to think about doing things differently due to these unforeseen, you know, transportation issues or HVAC issues, yeah, absolutely, there yep. might be a way to notate that. So, yeah, I agree. I agree. That sounds right. And I just wanted to briefly thank Michael for a very thorough presentation, great research, and he's led us through so many meetings, and also Dr. Downs, Mr. Campania, other folks that have uh, been involved in the development of this plan. And really, we really did kind of, because of COVID, you, we kind of had to go back and retool and rethink a lot of what we did um, over the past few years and still keep the essence of, of our cycle. And uh, he drew a lot of nice crosswalks for anything that we changed or moved. But yet, I think really did a great job outlining a vision for the next five years. So yep. thank you very much. Great. great job. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. a team effort, certainly. Scott, have you gotten a ride on the Toolcat yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I should. I, I, I was going to say we should have another Toolcat on there, but. <laughs> <laughs> Don, Don would roll up. Would, would, <laughs> <It's a> heart <laughs> attack. <Yeah. laughs> All right. I think we is that. Uh, is that That's it. Yeah, I appreciate okay. it. Good, good feedback. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Uh, th th I think that we should move on. Dr. Daly, you're going to give us an NRPS 2020 2025 update. Sure. Um, I don't have it up there. Are you okay if I yeah. project? Um, you're asking me, right? Yes, because <laughs> folks at home will be able to see. Um, you can kind of look over my shoulder. <laughs> um, but just very briefly, I just wanted to share an update. You know, this is 
a process that we're trying to be uh, careful and thorough in moving through, but also we want to keep moving ahead. Um, and so you should be able to see this on your screens. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. Okay, great. So again, our three big rocks we've established, teaching and learning, equity, student support services. And three big rocks that focus on these big ideas. There are 24 indicators under those rocks. These indicators help to promote coherence across the big rocks. For example, you'd see high quality professional development, digital learning, curriculum instruction assessment, and student voice expressed across them. Um, it allows some connections to other indicators across the strategy and promotes opportunities for alignment of administrator and educator goals. And then we have our strategic initiatives, which are organized by year. There are measurable outputs and outcomes. It defines the work we're doing each year in order to reach the five-year goals and provides opportunities for alignment of school improvement plans and educator and administrator goals for accountability and that synergy across. So these are the goals. Um, I'm sorry, these are the initiatives that we've established and we've added some indicators um, and you know, so that they're sort of numbered and, and educators and administrators are reporting that they're finding it um, helpful just to have that shorthand to refer to and to get a sense of the whole. So that's, that's something that people have, have responded well to. Um, and what, what we've been working on at the administrative level is these two here that are highlighted. So we've identified the, the high quality professional development around equity, diversity, and inclusion and MTSS under student services as being just two areas where every school is going to have either an administrator goal or a school improvement plan goal that's explicitly connected to this. So we're, we're all doing all of this, we're all working on it, but we wanna focus on a few areas. And quite honestly, one of the things that, that I'm grappling with is um, trying not to be exhaustive by doing this alignment process. You know, I wanna have, you know, the principals have their own goals, professional practice, student learning, they have school improvement plan goals, I want to have some of these team goals that are aligned, but I also want it to be not exhaustive. So that's honestly part of the conversation we're having is trying to come up with a way to have that synergy so that I, you know, we can have it across the board, but not have it feel overwhelming to folks. But we feel that at the very least, focusing on these two areas um, is important. So what I'm going to report here and then also um, more in the coming meetings and also in my goals report is just a few updates on what the work that we're doing here. So essentially what we've been doing um, we, we've taken the full leadership team of, so the administrative council with the principals and directors meets regularly on this. Over the summer, we had a retreat that also included our administrative council plus the extended leadership team. In the late summer, we had our full leadership team for the first time with all of our teacher leaders as well. The, the middle group, which includes our assistant principals and coordinators and directors, um, met last week and then we're meeting again this Thursday and what we're doing is we're taking each of these areas so for example we'll take SS21 MTS MTSS and we'll pull out what are we going to do in each year so this is just an example I don't expect this to be read it's more just for the format so you can see so the pink at the top we took all of the this is where we did the visioning exercise and we had lots of different ideas around um, what what things look like currently the blue at the bottom is where we want to be in five years so that's sort of the the um, the hybrid of all of the different suggestions and then what we've done is for 21 22 22 23 23 24 24 25 talked about what those initiatives are each year the people that are responsible the resources the outcomes the outputs and what we're doing a little bit differently this time is I've sort of assigned my core central office team so Michael led one that was on um, human resources and hiring. Um, Cynthia Conant led the MTSS. Mr. Clean led the one on um, equity, diversity, inclusion, um, professional development and strategy. And Dr. Downs is doing one around digital learning integration, just to, just to start. And we have fleshed those out and we're, we're building and shaping what these look like in the district. So, it's a slow process. That's where we are now. We're getting that feedback. The idea is that each of these 24 indicators would have a page that looks like this, and we would then share that out for some feedback with the larger group, with the community, um, make some tweaks and adjustments. It's, it's going to be a balance. It's, it's hard. Part of what's hard is that everyone has suggestions, everyone has ideas, everyone has priorities. 
So you want to try to put everyone's ideas and voice and make sure that everything that people suggested, people that took the time to provide feedback early in the process is represented. But at the same time, we can't do everything all at once, right? So we have to try to balance out where those things uh, come and where they fall. But that is the plan over the next few weeks to be put piecing these together, putting them out for feedback. And then, as I've said, in the, in the later fall to have this ready to, to present. But we're, there's enough of it here that we're able to follow along. We know what our priorities are. We know what we can align to. We're already using this, you know, we're meeting also on Thursday for the budget for next year, believe it or not, to, to, to kickstart that process. And we're gonna start to talk about what are those NRPS 2025 aligned positions and, and budget drivers. Um, so we have that process there. So I just wanted to provide an update if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to answer those, but I just wanted to give a, a check in on our progress. Any questions from anybody? I, I guess I just, as you were saying, it sounds like you are, um, but you're comfortable, are you comfortable with, it sounds like the process is happening, but at the same time you're, a, you're able to work with what you've accomplished so far and where you know you're going to be in terms of working this year towards you know towards your goals for this year and and, and setting up for things for next year so that, that's that's great um, uh, I guess that's just a comment so um, that's good I think we're good Rich can I ask a question please Sorry. so uh, I was just curious like what um, role actually Jody would you mind just to perform oh, the na name Actually's and address Jody. yeah um, Sorry, 365 Park Street. So I guess I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Daly what role the new equity pers like person is playing in this in this step of the like what role they're playing in the process that the shared person that we just hired. Yep, absolutely. Um, if they're what role they're playing in the new rock development. Yep, no, absolutely. So I, um, great question. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, this will segue nicely into the my goals report because part of that is the the um, where I've included some of this. But um, I can share it now that we. So I've met with Miss Barrows. Um, we had her. We introduced her um, a little bit and described her work at last meeting or maybe the meeting before. Um, quite explicitly, I sat with. Ms. Barrows and, and Mr. Colleen, and we took, we identified the three or four elements that we felt uh, really applied and we wanted her expertise and, and support. She's made it really clear, and I, and I completely agree that, you know, her job is not to do this work. Her, her job is to give us the support and the capacity to do this work and to lead this work in our district. And we're, we're all on the same page about what that is, but she's gonna be a wonderful um, resource for that. So she, um, her first experience with our, our leadership team was on October 8th during our professional development. And she led us through, just the, the very first stage for us was defining some terminology and, and making sure we had a common language and then also talking about, you know, what some of our goals are. Just early steps around what some of our goals and initiatives for this year are as an administrative team and as a district. So um, we see that role as, you know, being very, very key, important part of this. But again, um, her name and position is is not necessarily going to be explicitly in here. But what's in here, I know it's it's not meant to be read on this small screen. <laughs> but under persons responsible, it's, it says leadership team working in cooperation with our DEI coordinator. So a lot of these goals are, are that way, that it's a, a cooperative uh, process. But, but she's been um, a great resource so far. Great. Thank you. Yes. As an aside, that must, she, it must be so challenging for her to, to, to coordinate all that work with all the different districts that she's working with. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's quite a skill set to, yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's so much, it's, it's an exciting time, I think, I would imagine, to be in that, yeah. that field. There's so many um, job alikes and different groups having conversations. And, and I, you know, it's, it's almost like we're trying to pick the different groups that we're in. One, we just signed up for another. I believe we, we received sort of a mini grant to participate in this. Um, and it's, it's, its focus is really on just hiring and it's going through the process. And, but that, we had to commit a cross section of, you know, a principal, a district administrator, a teacher, 
and an HR person um, to that to really just learn about different initiatives. And I think this is going to be connected with some of the state um, and DESE initiatives around and, and possibly some, some additional funds to support incentives for, for different folks. So one idea that, that I found interesting was to recruit paraprofessionals who I think are such valuable um, assets to the district but to offer some incentives for more diverse paraprofessional support um, for our district. So there's a lot of exciting ideas out there, and uh, it's good to be able to tap into them as well. So. And then it sounds like we're segueing right to the your sure. goals update. Yes. So I just wanted to add um, a quick update here on, on this. Um, one second I'm just going to share my my goals I just wanted to just give a brief update on my goals where did my tab go I have so many tabs open uh, just a few just a few hints so you know one of my goals is about NRPS 2025 which I've shared here in the school improvement plan so we're working I've established a calendar with the principals um, where you know I, monthly I'm going to the schools as I've said to you in the past, my, my role when I'm in those schools, that's not really my time to be visible. I mean, obviously I'm visible and I'm, I'm there for that as well. I'm getting in there at other times for visibility. My job really there is to meet with the principal, to talk about issues at the school, and to try and observe the principal observing teachers and to really facilitate that, that evaluation process. So we're gonna spend some of our time talking about our aligned goals and the school improvement plans and some of that work that's being done there. And it's sort of a, we're going to do a monthly check-in on those goals and what they look like. And so that's already started with our September meetings, and now I'm having all my October meetings. We're having real focused evaluations, um, using doing walkthroughs using uh, what to look for guides, which, which are, have been recently updated by the Department of Ed, that um, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the question, do we find this tool useful, both to the administrators and to the teachers? So, I think, I think that we'll find it especially helpful when you're getting into subjects where the observer may not be a content expert, but it gives you some guides. Like if I'm in a world language classroom, if I'm in a you know, upper level mathematics classroom, here are things I should see. So even if I'm not a content expert, here are some ways I can provide some useful feedback and dialogue and, um, and provide some information. So I think they're, they're good tools for us to use, so we're excited to do that. We're also really going into this question of what data do we have and what data do we need. So uh, Mr. Colleen and I e even participated in a webinar just this morning on some of the updates to the early warning indicator system we have. And it's, you know, it's interesting. In our district, we don't have a lot of um, incidents, like students that are at risk, right, for, for not graduating high school, for not passing MCAS. We have very low numbers. So in some ways, that can be an issue that we don't pay attention to because it's not a front burner issue but at the same time I think you can look at it the other way and say because the numbers are so small we can really devote some time and resources to really address these uh, concerns and so um, I think that question that we always ask with data what data do we have what data do we need we're going to really get in a look at and, and start so I've asked the principals all to come up with sort of a data driven question that you know for example we're looking at the high school through an equity lens you know, what access do all students have to higher level courses? And just looking at the data, how many students of color, how many students uh, with disabilities have been able to take higher level classes? And then ask the questions why? You know, is there anything that we have in place, um, either consciously, unconsciously, that, that may be preventing them systemically from accessing a course? And it may just be um, opportunity, it may be, um, you know, encouragement it may be systems we have in place that put them on a path that then they can't find their way to, to to get into a different course or a different path so those are some of the questions we're going to be exploring and um, you know those are obviously different at different levels and they're differentiated but there's a lot of information there's a lot of data these are questions that are being asked in every district across the state and we're, we're looking at them here as well and there's certainly connections between that process and what we're doing with, with MTSS and with data for decision making, which is a part of NRPS 2025. Uh, with my, my personal goal of my uh, new superintendent's induction program and my professional development, just a little update on that. I've met 
um, already once with my extended group in person. We're doing some hybrid. Tomorrow I have my second one, which is a two-hour virtual. And some of the things that we're doing there is that you know, we're, the, the objective for tomorrow is that we're going to gain further insight into the why and how strategy implementation. And we're going to use the Bowman and Deal's four frames. So looking at the structural, human resource, political, and symbolic aspects of the decisions and what goes into the strategy. So that's some of the thinking that we used as we built NRPS 2025. And this is good with this group to review that. And then I've also got a smaller group where I'm able to do um, some more individual sharing and, and focus and mentoring type work in that group as well. Um, the communication goal, I'm continuing to explore uh, just, just even the, the question of frequency, just how we're using the community bulletin board. Um, I'm sharing that out, trying to, trying to you know, not overload with information and updates, trying to get more people to use the community bulletin board and to subscribe to it um, so that you're not getting constant reminders about you know, fundraisers and signups and all that. Um, but at the same time, you don't want those messages to go completely unnoticed. And, you know, people will say that, you know, you get so many messages from school, you don't know which ones to pay attention to, which ones not to. So that's something I'm really trying to balance. I've tried to um, balance the reporting on, the, on the, the dashboard and the positive cases. I haven't been doing them daily this year. I've been doing sort of more weekly updates. I'm trying to get the dashboard updated daily, um, but I've been giving um, less frequent updates on the, on the dashboard. And the, the case counts have been uh, much less, as, as we discussed as well. Um, I did want to just share about the diversity, equity, and inclusion goal, but I think I've shared that um, in response to Ms. Clooney's question. So, um, but we did have our first professional development last week, and we're looking forward to, to working with, um, with Ms. Barrows again on our upcoming uh, professional development in a few weeks. So, Mr. Clean has been in constant contact with her and figuring out how to fit um, some of her skills into what we're doing also with our our walkthroughs and also our um, professional development for staff. And then, you know, one thing that we've all identified through NRPS 2025, through Ms. Barrow's work, is the, the student voice piece. So trying to have her interact with our students because I think some of the best work we can do is when teachers, and so we have some student-led professional development where students will be able to share their own experiences. Students of color, for example, sharing their experiences going through North Reading, which I think is some of the most powerful um, information that our teachers can have. Um, when you hear it from your own students um, and their own perspectives, I think that's pretty powerful. So the students brought that forward to us um, through Mr. Clean, and I'm really excited about that. That's sort of, to me, ties in with everything we're trying to do. So um, just a few updates there. I thought at this point in the year, I'd give you um, some information. Any questions for me? Anybody have questions? Nope. I think that's great. Very good. Thank you for the update. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to routine matters. We have some minutes. Sure. Mm -hmm. I need to, okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the executive session minutes for September 27 um, as written. Second. Uh, okay, any discussion? Any issues? No, I didn't see any. Roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Scott? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Motion carries. Cool. Um, I'd like to make a motion to accept the open session minutes of September 27 uh, as written. Second. Any discussion? Nope. A roll call vote. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Chris? Aye. Scott? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Motion carries. I'd like to make a motion to accept the open session town meeting minutes of October 4th as written. Janine, should you make the motion yeah. if you weren't there? Oh, yeah. That's I can make the motion to, to do it. I just will not yeah, that's, vote. But then you'll abstain on it? Yep. <laughs> Second. I suppose. That's fine. And uh, uh, thank you for those who were able to attend. I apologize for not being there. But uh, uh, roll call vote for those who were in attendance. So uh, Diana. Aye. Chris. Aye. And Scott. Aye. And Janine and I abstain yeah, as we were not yeah. there. 
Motion carries three to nothing. Yeah. Uh, budget update, no, no update uh, for the, this time. That's correct. And no staffing update, Dr. Daly? None of this time. Bids and donations, uh, I will uh, uh, go ahead and, and uh, do my usual reading <laughs> as I get to them. All the way to the back. All the way, last two, right? Yep. Okay, I move that the school committee vote to accept, I, I think it's all right if I make a motion, right? Yeah, uh, we'll survive this. Yeah, exactly. This vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $300 from Mr. Timothy Richmond for helping with filling packets for the triathlon. These I funds see. are to benefit the cross country team at the high school. I second. Roll call vote. Uh, Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Scott? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Thank you very much. I move that the committee uh, vote to accept with gratitude a donation in the amount of $1,300 from the North Reading High School booster, Debbie Collins, for the payment of preseason hockey ice rental. I second. Uh, and just a very generous uh, donation. Uh, roll call vote, Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Scott? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Thank you again. Subcommittee updates. The finance planning team met on September 29th. Scott, my sense, my recollection is that we completed discussing the warrant articles, which have subsequently been voted on one way or the other, and that was about it. We're going to really start the work for next year uh, at the meetings ahead. Is that was that your under uh, how you recall it? You are exactly correct. All right. The athletic subcommittee met on the 13th. Diana or Janine? We talked about the fall season, just got an update on that enrollment, and that looked actually pretty decent. It wasn't a, you know, a significant impact from, you know, COVID or anything like that, which was great. Right. Um, we updated on the lighting, which I know we touched upon when we looked mm -hmm. at capital. Um, the message board in the front of the school, the one that usually has, you know, the manual message board, um, there's been some thoughts of potentially updating that. And I think um, what's, how do I reference Chuck's role? Um, the, the Hall of Fame. Yeah. The Hall of Fame, yeah. Yeah, the Hall of Fame. They wanted to kind of potentially help support that. So there's some discussions on updating that location, things of that nature. Is that the board that the, the, the the various senior classes donate their excess mm -hmm. funds yes. to as well? Yes. yes. Correct. So yeah. we're exploring some different ideas. I think the Hall of Fame one now is focused more on a smaller sign that may be at the bottom of the hill coming down facing up. So as you're coming out, if you're if you're stopped there for the light, you can read a message, which is a, a nice idea that's a little different than, than I'd been thinking. I think in addition, we're thinking about replacing the manual sign um, which is out on the road with a two-way. So we're right. pricing those out and thinking that now. And then sort of a, a tertiary idea is uh, the scoreboard itself being updated and possibly having some message capabilities as well as some of the newer scoreboards do. So there's a lot to consider, but we're, we're currently pricing out some, some ideas there. So some of that funding Hall of Fame, some of it from class donations, and some we're going we're gonna to see what we can do because it's, um, it's certainly something that would be beneficial you know it, it gets a lot of great visibility I know, I know the town even puts town meeting notice you know there's, there's different notices that can go up there and when you can do that electronically and you're not having to come down there in the rain and change the letters <laughs> um, you can definitely get more information up there probably even maybe rotate some messages and so yeah. we're going to investigate what they can do so it's it's definitely exciting so we're yep. going to explore that I'm biased because I like it because it's old school. <laughs> it, is, it, it, has, it has that old school I know, feel for sure. I know, it has sure. nostalgia too. And I, like, and I also like the signs that people that the town puts up for various events uh, on the fencing as yeah. well. Yeah, it's very, I don't know, it would be sad to see it go oddly enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think we just reviewed the budget. I, I think we weren't sure how last year's budget was mm -hmm. going to close out, and there was a reflection of that which looked good. Um, and, yeah, we were tracking fine. Did I miss anything? Still a preview of the winter season, some of the yeah. um, dismissals and things that need to happen. So we're still, you know, we're making some adjustments with the start times. Um, it's, it's certainly not been um, very much of a concern. Golf team had to have a few early dismissals. Um, 
you know, some of this is due, it's due to that. It's also due to the busing issues and transportation issues that other districts are having as well. Um, but we're trying to minimize any kind of early dismissals and other schools are, are being very accommodating, understanding that we might be one of the earlier adopters of a later start time. Um, but we feel that it's manageable and not, not very disruptive. But some of the basketball team might have to, to be dismissed early on a few, a few occasions. Thank you all. The subcommittee schedule coming up. Uh, the Fine Arts Subcommittee is scheduled to meet on October 28th uh, at 3.30. Finance Planning Team has got a meeting scheduled for the 20, October 29th at 8.15 a.m. And the Athletic Subcommittee will be uh, reconvening on December 15th at 12 p.m. Uh, administrative report, Dr. Daly, do you have anything to share? Uh, no, nothing else at this time. All right, and no correspondence? None at this Mr. Time. McGowan. Mr. Buckley. <laughs> And I can just add one more thing, just a shout out to the Bass School. I mean, I don't know how much we care about rankings and things like that, but U.S. World the News did publish uh, something on the best schools in in the state, and Bat Shelter was number eleven on that on that publication. That is a, a nice accomplishment for sure. And um, future business. So we'll, we're meeting again on uh, November 8th at 6.30 uh, for the fiscal year 2022 budget and federal grant COVID updates. On the November 29th, uh, the student services presentation and December 6th for the NRPS 2025 updates uh, at that time. And I believe that's all we have. So if, unless anybody has anything else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I will make a motion to adjourn. And I will second. All right, roll call vote. Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. Diana? Aye. Scott? Aye. And I am an aye as well. Good night, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Go Sox.